Hello and welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media. Today we're joined by Dr. Robin Cook, who is a research associate with, and I'm going to read it, make sure I get it right, the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, or ACRA. He's part, part of the University of Western Australia. It's a great pleasure. We're going to be looking at the first images uh, from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and these are the research teams that will be crunching the numbers and putting some insights into these uh, fantastic and amazing images that the world uh, has been seeing and sharing. So without further ado, Dr. Robin Cook from Perth. Robin, Hello. thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Great to be here. Wonderful. And look, it really is uh, a pleasure to, to have you here because, again, we're seeing all these images, but then what does it really mean other than uh, some amazing uh, footage and it really looks like a you know an amazing uh, universe that we're in yeah where do, where do we start maybe your background and and what you actually look at and do and and what acra is doing and how you've become involved uh yeah, with right. uh, the, this uh this uh telescope yeah i mean it's it's an incredibly exciting time you can really just feel the buzz around the yeah. around the office at the moment i, I don't think anyone's really gotten anything done uh, outside of, you know, looking at James uh, Space Telescope images for the last week or so. So, you know, it's really a buzz of excitement around. Yeah, so, so um, you know, I'm a, now a postdoctoral researcher here um, at, at ICRA. Uh, you're right, it's a bit of a mouthful to say, the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research. But, oh. but that's our focus there, that, that radio astronomy part. So um, we're working with what's called the Square Kilometer Array, which is soon to be uh, yeah. the biggest radio telescope in the world. And we're sort of, you know, competing here with the James Webb Space Telescope in terms of title for the for the most powerful telescope. But um, yeah, this, this square kilometre array is what we're really focused on. Well, I was going to say that, I mean, when you add it to the SKA, it's this is really an incredible, we're going to be seeing and hearing like we've never heard and seen before. How, how will yeah, these two brutal. work together? Will they be two different data sets and Absolutely, who's putting yeah. those together? Are you part of that project? Yeah, so that, that's really important. So we're not when I say we're competing, we're actually really working together, combining <laughs> the power of these two uh, awesome facilities uh, combined. So yeah, the radio part of the spectrum, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, obviously gives you a completely different view of the universe than than the infrared or even the optical that we see with our eyes. So combining those two together gives us so much more information about galaxy evolution, about uh, supermassive black holes, about the early universe that otherwise you wouldn't see, right? So I always think of it like you're putting on different lenses, you're seeing the universe through mm. different parts of light and you're gathering different parts of physics uh, there. So so radio astronomy is very different from, from optical and infrared astronomy. The images look, you know, nothing alike. Um, what you're really focusing on is the really high energy stuff. So in, in radio astronomy, so that's like your supermassive black holes, creating outflows, you know, supernova, exploding stars, those kind of things. That's what the radio really uh, hones in on. Um, whereas the optical and the infrared are really looking at the stars and they're looking at the dust inside of galaxies. So I, I guess the tone that I'm kind of creating here is that we are looking at galaxies. We're looking at the evolution of galaxies through all different mechanisms, right? All the way from the supermassive black holes that are at the center of their galaxies, the stars that are being formed out of the gas, and then the dust and the material that's in between that sort of gets in the way. And... It's almost like information overload a little bit. How, where are you thinking of starting? And, you know, you look like a young fella. So, you know, you've got your whole career, basically this type of research, it's not going to stop. And I suppose another point is how much new research is going to come out of this is, you know, in terms of even understanding who we are and, and the universe that we're in. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. I mean, yeah, I, I'm quite young to this, um, and it's, I, I must be very lucky to be in a time where yeah. the, the James Webb Space Telescope is starting to be launched, because I think it's really true, and I've been hearing this a lot, especially from some of the people that have been in this for a bit longer than I have, um, that there's going to be a time before the James Webb Space Telescope, and there'll be a time afterwards, right? The, the paradigm shift that we're going to see in the way we see the universe is going to completely change after the images or the, the data's crunched kind of completely and, and seen in, in totality, all the data that we'll get from the, the, the web. So, yeah, I mean, for me, it's really exciting because um, I'm in this transition period between, uh, you know, understanding what we, we think we know about the universe and, and then kind of moving well beyond that with, with the power of the James Webb Space Telescope. And you, you raised a good point, you know, that the web, while it takes these really pretty images and the kind of science questions that we're asking are you know, very technical and 
uh, trying to uncover these mysteries. I think it's a really uh, human kind of set of questions that we're trying to ask. I mean, some of the big ones we're, we're you know, trying to get at a, a where, where did we come from, right? What is what is the origins of of humans? And I mean that from a point of like not just you know where did the planet come from, but what are the stars around the planet that we came from, and what's the galaxy that we're in, and where did that come from, and and where are the first oxygen and carbon atoms formed in the universe? And that's really what the James Webb's kind of trying to ask from the sort of really far distant universe kind of questions. And yeah. then you've got, um, you know, uh, what what what's unique about the Earth? What are, what are we? What's so special about the earth that makes it, you know, conducive to life? And then I guess the third big question is, are we alone? Right. And th these are some of the questions that James Webb is trying to answer. It, it looks like, uh, and I'll bring up the image uh, that mm. we're going to talk about. When we look at the amount uh, of, and these images, and I'll just keep that up there, that won't interrupt it. So that's where we're getting this in particular image. And this is part of the research that you're going to be looking at, is this particular image. And... I'm looking, I've been thinking about comparisons and it's almost like cells in a, in a blood flow, you know, in terms of the, the density and, and the like of galaxies and hence we're the only living, you know, uh, it's been thought that we might be the only sort of uh, intelligent life being in the Milky Way. So our own galaxy, there's one intelligent life, but if every galaxy, if that's the purpose of a galaxy is to create life, then you know, it's a pretty incredible universe and it's almost unlikely that there's not other intelligent life or there won't be, you know, civilizations come and go. Uh, it's a matter of time. So mm. what, are you, what, what, what does this type of image tell you? And it's much, much better than, the, say, the Hubble uh, telescope and what we've been seeing previously. But we kind of get a sense that there's, you know, many trillions of universes. What does this tell you initially when you first saw it? Is, did it tell you anything, anything new? Uh, yeah. straight away yeah I mean, I mean it's, it's incredible to look at and and I highly recommend anyone to just sort of click on the the website there and actually search it for it themselves you don't really get the justice yeah. unless you start sort of diving in zooming in because it's just the scale of this thing is is incredible um it, it's I mean it's complete it's really striking to me you know you just how much detail comes out especially comparing to some of these older images um you can you know see a few blobs for maybe some of the the more massive galaxies and then of course, moving over to Hubble, you get some more detail, but you're seeing a different kind of the electromagnetic spectrum. And, and Hubble itself was not as powerful a telescope, so you're certainly not seeing as deep and, and not as much not, not as much detail. Um, there's so much to say about this, an image like this, right? And, and maybe I'll, I'll say as well that this is sort of just, I mean, it's a targeted observation, but it, at the end of the day, this is just a random piece of the universe. Right? Yeah. Another thing to this to is say. the one... This is nothing I, special, this, this really. Is... Yeah, this was the one that was described as a single grain of sand on the tip of your finger at an arm's length. So that's right uh, of the sky. Hence, why you know the density there and the, and the diversity is another thing that strikes me in this. Yeah, yeah, you're seeing so many different uh, levels of the of the you know distances to the universe. So I mean, the first thing to point out in these images are these sort of very bright hexagonal spiked uh, objects, and and these are just stars, right? These are just stars in our own sort of Milky Way galaxy, these are ones that are nearby right. to us. And I always think about this like we're trying to study uh, cities, right? We know that galaxies form in groups, in, in clusters, and in this case we're looking at a galaxy cluster. And we think of them like cities, right? They arrange themselves in, in towns and cities and villages. And we're sort of sitting in our own Milky Way galaxy, which is a city of its own, and these stars are like the individual people sort of getting in the way of our, you know, almost <laughs> photobombing our images, our beautiful shots <laughs> right. of like Melbourne City over across the continent. And so, so what you can see are these sort of really bright, hazy, uh, massive galaxies. And this is a nearby uh, group of galaxies. But you might kind of notice around there's, there's these handful of very red, uh, almost distorted looking uh, galaxies. And yeah. this is not sort of in the same plane as, say, in the, not in the same city as these uh, larger galaxy group ones. These are actually well be behind this group. They're, they're in the distant universe. And what's really kind of mind bending about this image is that those those galaxies are sort of being distorted and warped around the galaxy cluster. The way I like so to think of it is... Is it bending light? Is that what it's yeah, doing? Yeah, it's, it's bending, bending light, like a light. magnifying glass. Yeah. Right. So magnifying is it, glass is it because of the way we're seeing it or is the light itself, but well, it must must be if if we're it's the light observing itself. it yeah, that It's way. the light yeah, right. itself being affected. This is not a, 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 an optical illusion. I mean, it, in yeah, some ways it is. It's not a lens issue. It's really physically happening. 
right? Yeah, this, right. Is a, this is gravity itself. Like the mass from this galaxy cluster is distorting space itself. It's creating sort of a ripple or a, a, a depression in, in space time. Um, and, and the light has to follow space, right? Light follows straight lines and, in, and, a, and a straight line in a curved space is, is bent to us. And yeah. so what's happening is these things, whilst they're behind the galaxy group, are, are being bent around and they're sort of coming from the edges of the galaxy group, and you're seeing them Have in this we ever very seen distorted it So close. I mean, this I think this is the Einstein's theory as well, the blanket sort yeah, of approach. Bit, but, exactly. Yeah, and we have seen it before. Have we ever seen it so strikingly? Do you think from never? Such so what we, yeah. right? I mean, we've seen examples of this for sure. Um, yeah. What we haven't seen are the the the, the number of galaxies that are being distorted, uh, so so uh, kind of incredibly differently right the the variety of distortions that we're seeing here are, are wild because what i haven't said about this image is that a lot of these uh red distorted galaxies are actually duplicates they're the same galaxy being observed multiple times because they're bending around from different directions so maybe some go on the left some go on the right and so you get mirrored images of the same galaxy just uh shown from different angles got it we've never seen that variety of that um, and now the colors, I suppose, is is indicative of distance. Uh, in some so ways, the yes. or orange, the whites, the yellows. Yeah, in some ways. So that's it's a, it's a combination of things. I mean, fundamentally, the color of a galaxy, or actually more truly, the color of stars, has a lot to do with the age of that star. So young stars typically are blue. They're massive and they're they're really hot and energetic. They're burning a lot of their fuel. Older stars that are kind of reaching the end of their their lifetimes, they're typically red. They've puffed out. They've cooled down relatively, uh, and and they appear red. So now, a galaxy that's filled with red stars is what we would typically call an evolved galaxy, one that hasn't had any recent star formation. But kind of underpinning all of this is this idea of redshift, and and this is a really crucial part about uh, this image and about astronomy in general. It's this idea of redshift, where um, things are sort of being stretched out. The wavelengths of light here that. Uh, that we would otherwise see are being stretched to more red colors. And I, I always think about this like an ambulance going by, right? When, when an ambulance goes by, it's sort of really high pitched to begin with. And as it passes, yeah. it sort of drops in frequency, or I should say it, its wavelengths get stretched out and its sound gets lower. The same thing is happening with light, right? So things that are traveling away from you have their light being stretched out. And that's really crucial because the, the infrared spectrum uh, we're not looking at the infrared light of these galaxies. We're actually looking at their their optical light, but it's been stretched so far into the red that we're now seeing it as infrared light. And this is why the James Webb Space Telescope is so powerful, because it can look at things that are really far in the universe, moving really fast away from us, i.e. being stretched out, uh, yeah. and observe them in those infrared wavelengths. Because we'll be able to detect, detect speed and, and mass and a whole range of different things. This And maybe just to clarify, this is an optical image. This is what it is actually seeing. It's not any type of light. This is optical. Oh, this, so this is actually infrared. This is, this is oh, infrared. Okay, this is it. like okay. a crucial advancement of the James Webb Space Telescope. Got is it. that now we're going from the optical, what our eyes see, to moving into the, uh, to the infrared wavelength. So some of the galaxies you'll see, especially the nearby ones, That'll be like, and, and you know, some of these other images that we show from the James Webb Space Telescope, those are like what the infrared looks like for these, these galaxies. That's, that's like seeing these galaxies through the infrared. The crucial part about this, this, this image is that this is so distant, so far away, that the light itself has shifted, right? It's been, it's been stretched out to the point where it's in the infrared. So it's, it's almost like we, we're seeing the optical light, but it, 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 as it shows itself in the infrared, that's the, that's well, the important how, part. Of is it still possible to detect its its distance and the like? Is it going to be more difficult to do that because you don't know how stretched it is? Exactly. This is the really tough part about this. So typically with, with distances, we, we have a good sense of the, the sort of expected brightness of a galaxy based on some other properties. And so if we know how bright we expect it to be and how bright it actually is, you get a sense of the distance. The yeah. really crazy part about gravitational lensing and, and that this is this effect where you have galaxies sort of being bent around uh, objects of mass is that not only does it stretch the light in certain ways it also amplifies the brightness and in fact that's the really cool part about this is that these galaxies if there wasn't an intervening lens it's almost acting like a telephoto lens right on a camera if that galaxy group wasn't there none of these galaxies would be visible or very few of them because their light is being boosted by that that gravitational lens wow, okay. amplification, so it gives us a way to see even further into the universe 
um, than otherwise would be possible. The real trick, of course, is then you have to take that distorted image of a galaxy, undistort it, right? And the only way to do that is to know a lot about the lens itself, know a lot about yeah. the galaxy group in the in the intervening uh, part, and 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 sort of recreate what that galaxy would otherwise look like. Um, and then you can start thinking about distances. You can think about properties like mass and and, and shape and structure. One other thing is with the way that the SKA and James Webb uh, Web will be sort of coordinating, is it something that, say, the SKA would point at this same zone and see what sort of we might detect out of that, or will it be doing yeah. its own body? Yeah, of I mean, it, it will do its own thing. I mean, it's because it does look through a different sort of spectrum of light. Maybe I can tell you what I think would happen if you did point the square kilometre array. Yeah, at this. okay, good. Um, so, so you've got this intervening group of galaxies here, and and you can kind of pick out this haze of light that's going around. And this is these are this is debris. This is this is stars that have been shredded off the galaxies, or somehow uh, uh, ejected from the galaxies themselves. And and that's really important. We want to know why or how stars can be stripped away from galaxies. And one of the kind of ideas that you that we might have is that at the center of every galaxy is a supermassive black hole, and the sort of energy, the outflows that get emitted from these supermassive black holes are scales of, of you know, many times the galaxy itself so they're really shooting out high energy uh, uh, particles and and that's of course going to have a huge effect on the galaxy itself it's going to you know, send out shock waves through the galaxy and, yeah. and emit stars and so what you would see in the in the in the optical oh, sorry in the radio are these massive jets these outflows from supermassive black holes definitely one from the center one there probably few from other galaxies around and you'd see the way those those um, filaments or those uh, outflows would be ripping up uh, the gas around them. And, and you'll see that in incredible detail uh, with, with the square kilometre array. So you can kind of see that you're not really probing the same uh, objects, or at least you, you're not looking at the same uh, parts of the galaxy there. There'd be a completely different view of this, this image. And what specific piece of research are you working on? Yeah, so we, we're, we're really interested in, in how you get from galaxies that look like this here in the distant universe to how you get galaxies that look like our own galaxy. And so there's, you know, I can't even count the number of things that could possibly happen to a galaxy to make it look uh, slightly different. You've got galaxies that merge with one another. You've got, you know, these supermassive black holes. You've got uh, bursts of star formation. There's so much that happens inside of galaxies. And we're trying to recreate that um, step by step throughout the universe so going from the very early universe where things were very chaotic and very energetic how do you get to the the galaxies that we look at in the nearby what? universe and there's a few examples of nearby galaxies in in this image here they look some of them look like sort of spirally uh maybe uh more grand design type of uh spiral galaxies um and and so we're trying to understand the processes involved in, in getting from there to there now of course the the trick with astronomy or maybe the, the the catch is that when we take an image of a galaxy that's a still frame right that's a snapshot in time you know we can't possibly uh we don't live for long enough to see anything evolve right so we we, we have this yeah. problem of only seeing snapshots in time so we're really trying to take uh snapshots at different points in the universe distances but also you know points yeah. in time uh, in order to get a sense, a build-up of the storyline of the universe going from the oldest galaxies to, to the ones we see today was there any any galaxies that are looking like the Milky Way? How unique do you think the Milky Way is? Or have you seen observations of the Milky Way looking galaxies before? You raise a really interesting point um, and one that I can't comment on because I'm not a, a, a galactic astronomer. I'm an extra galactic astronomer. And what that means is I look at galaxies other than our own Milky Way. And it and it's, and it's comes back to this point of looking at cities, right? When When I say we're trying to observe other cities yeah. It's like me uh, trying to tell you what Perth City looked like by being at the very center of Perth City. Right? We don't actually have a good sense of what our own Milky Way looks like right. as an image because yeah. we're, we're sitting inside of it. I could tell you a lot about what Melbourne looks like from afar, but I, I couldn't tell <laughs> yeah. you what, what Perth looks like. We have a few, well, we, we have a general idea of what we think the, the Milky Way looks like. It's one of these barred spirals. So it's a spiral galaxy with spiral arms. It has a bar yeah. at its center and a, quite a puffy bulge at the at, at its at its center and probably a, a supermassive black hole. In fact, not probably, definitely because we just took an image we of do. one. Yeah, we um, found it. Right. So we know that for for sure now. Um, and so yeah, I mean, you could probably point out uh, a handful of galaxies in that image that had that same description that fit that same uh, that match. What's your uh, so I was going to ask you. You mentioned that uh, galactic research is that what you are doing? Is that yeah, what extra you are? galactic? So extra beyond galactic. the beyond, beyond the galaxy. 
Okay. Anything that's outside and, of our galaxy, I'm interested in. And what what uh, you are you working on a what what sort of title would you give the research that you are doing? Uh, are you working around the black hole sort of theories and your general thoughts uh, as a young researcher on how galaxies and the universe is actually working? Are you working out beyond what would be considered normal theory? Yeah, we're trying. We're, we're definitely pushing uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, the expectation. You know, we, we, we as scientists are always trying to prove ourselves wrong, right? It'd be boring. If You're allowed to ask the stupid and... question, right? And then see if it's true or a <laughs> yeah, fantastic exactly. question. You've got to have that bit of creativity or, or willingness to sort of throw things aside for, for a moment just to, to test different different ideas, different hypotheses. Um, yeah, we, we, we're te testing different ideas of, of galaxy evolution for sure. Um, you know, like I said, we, we want to understand how a galaxy can go from being, uh, I said, well, how the universe can go from just being hydrogen atoms to the in intense levels of complexity that we have around us, you know, yeah. planets, stars, galaxies. How does how does that structure form? And you know, there's there's so much that goes into that, and and every each one of us is of course working on a you know small facet of 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 galaxy evolution, which is itself a you know really big research field. And that's the field I would call a galaxy evolution. Um, and so I guess my my uh, bread and butter is is the shapes of galaxies and so uh you know galaxies have this wide complexity of the way they look you know they can either be these spiral galaxies with 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 arms and 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 tidal tails uh or they can be these large elliptical galaxies so these sort of mosh pits of stars that have no defined structure they're sort of just a puffy ball of, of stars and so something has to happen between those uh, archetypes of galaxies to you know to explain those differences and so we're really trying to understand how you go from those galaxies to these these sort of uh, uh, elliptical uh, dead we call them red and dead galaxies because essentially they've lost all their star formation they're not forming yeah. any stars anymore they've, they've run out of the gas that they need the fuel that they need to form new stars uh, what is it about these the structure of these galaxies that's caused them to to look this way or, or, or undergo this this suppression in star formation and i suppose if you think about it the cities and even our own diversity on earth the process of evolution even in space and how galaxies are formed and planets every everywhere is different you'll always find something new the local environment the, you know the, there's an adaptation to the local environment and exactly. we may well be very unique we might not be the only intelligent life but the way we, we've evolved because uh, there's no set kind of rules on evolution, is there? You evolve. So can you no, imagine? We think we know, right? We think we have a set yeah. of constraints that that kind of gives you the formula for creating human life. And it's, you know, things like yeah. liquid water and uh, an oxygen-rich atmosphere and a certain temperature range to keep that water uh, the way we want it. But, you know, there's not to say that there's a, a life form out there that, you know, strives on on a sulfur-rich atmosphere or, a, yeah. you know, a methane uh, water system or liquid methane as their uh, their system, you know. So it's, it's we, we think we know uh, our formula for, for life, but that's not to say that, yeah, there's, there's all that other stuff out there that fits a different set of parameters. And that's what, we're, you know, it's being looked for. Um, what's the update? Are you involved with the SKA directly or yeah. more the James so, Webb? So really my research involves the, the precursor telescope. So of course, when they were thinking about building the square kilometer array, it wasn't just about dumping a bunch of telescopes on the ground and seeing if it worked. There was a lot of uh, initial sort of precursor instrumentation being put together. And so one of them is known as uh, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder and another one, Meerkat, which is in South Africa. So the two of them are the these precursor telescopes to the, to the Square yeah. Kilometre Array. And I work with that data um, looking at uh, star formation happening in galaxies, but through the radio. Um, so star formation... Uh, we really want to know about, right? Star formation is like the key to understanding the evolution of a galaxy. If it's not forming stars anymore, uh, it means it's dead. It's something's happened to it. What's happened to it? Um, the trick is you can kind of use radio frequencies in order to kind of give you a clue at how much star formation has happened because those radio frequencies are probing supernova explosions that have gone off. So if a star blows up, it, it sends out these high energy shock waves and we can actually show an image of, of the James Webb looking at, at, a, at a supernova explosion. That's the Southern Ring Nebula. Um, yeah. Those shock waves that you're seeing that uh, will also emit in the radio wavelengths. So you'll end up seeing what's called synchrotron radiation. Uh, and that only shows up in, in the radio. And we can use that to, to start to understand um, star formation and, and death in some ways. 
will the structure of the image be the same or is the data set different? Yeah, right. Yeah, Got no, it. it's com it'll be completely different. You see exactly. different. You see it differently completely, yeah. You'll see it completely differently. In some ways, you know, the, the radio data is less uh, what we call resolved, so you'll have less detail in it, and that's simply because the wavelengths of light are so much longer. To think about it, right, um, James Webb is looking from uh, 0.6 microns to uh, uh, 200 microns, or some sort of range in the, in the mid-infrared, um, whereas the square kilometer array will be looking in the meter length, you know, things yeah, that are a meter yeah, long, right. centimeters long. So the difference in wavelength there tells you a lot, uh, tells you a lot of different things, but the images themselves will look completely different for that reason as well. Very good. Um, where is the SKA at? Maybe just an update on where that is at? Yeah, so, I mean, so it's, you know, we're in this phase where we're working with the precursor telescopes and uh, in some ways we're sort of, the, the telescopes are too good, these these precursors. They're doing too good science, you know, where, wow. where they were meant to be just sort of trialing telescopes, but the kind of science that's coming out of them is, is sort of incredible. In terms of the full square kilometer array itself, so a lot of the contracts have been signed, uh, you know, they we're getting ready to start putting those dishes onto the ground, onto the desert in, in here in Western Australia. There'll be these antennae uh, and things are getting started. So in the next couple of years, we'll start to see uh, instrumentation being placed on the ground, which is a really exciting thing for a telescope yeah. to be, you know, and it's, it, it, it suffers a similar story to the James Webb Space Telescope that sort of took, you know, 20 years or maybe yeah. even more to get from a thought to a to a real working instrumentation uh, instrument. So in some ways, the square kilometer array has suffered, suffered a lot of these yeah. these problems as well. And so I there's delays. I remember being talked about yeah. in the sort of before 2010, you know, exactly. 2005, yeah. 2006 was being discussed then. So, yeah, yeah. It has I been was sort of decade. promised as a, a, a fledgling <laughs> astronomer that, you know, when I get into my, my PhD, the square kilometer array will be up and running and, and, yeah. and looking Still. at the universe. But, you know, in some ways, it's not a bad thing. I, I'm kind of now working on, on things, uh, the precursors, and it's sort of exciting yeah. to be in, amongst the journey itself. Um, the last one is uh, the, the computing. Are you, you're involved with sort of high performance computing and, what type of computing uh, are you using for to crunch these numbers? Yeah, I mean the 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 scale of the data that's coming down from things like the square kilometer array. In fact, well, I should say this: the James Webb Space Telescope, in terms of data size, is not particularly big. The challenge it comes when you start looking at radio data, right? We're talking, yeah. you know, the size of the internet's worth of data being collected in you know just a week or two of observations with the square kilometer array these are kind of the scales that we're dealing with yeah. petabytes of data that need to be sort of uh, almost on the fly processed because you can't store that kind of data anywhere not you know reasonably uh, without being kind of exorbitantly expensive so you have to think about how am i going to take all this data at such a, a rapid rate compress it deal with it, analyze it, and just keep the stuff that I want and throw away everything else. And so a whole part of the of ICRA here is, is dealt with data-intensive astronomy. So dealing with the, the high-performance computing side of things, dealing with um, the data storage, dealing with the, the image processing. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not a solved problem. It's not something that yeah. we have the solution for. And, and sort of part of uh, the square kilometer array was going under the assumption that by the time we'd built the telescope, those problems had been solved and you know they are being worked on and we've definitely made you know huge headway on on in terms of this processing but those problems are still around and there's still people you know for sure working on this to try to get solutions for when it does and mm. where does this put perth on the map and sort of western australia globally in the sector because you're more on the research side versus the space industry side how much collaboration and co-research uh, is uh, your work involved with? Yeah, I mean, so ICRA itself has only been around for um, 10, 11, 12 years or something like that. And I've only sort of been here for the latter six years. And so it's crazy to see how much of an evolution we've had going from uh, sort of a, a small department of, of 10 people to now, you know, many hundreds of people across multiple yeah. nodes across Perth and 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 the international in in ICRA is actually now true because we are collaborating you know across every continent on the planet maybe not Antarctica but um, <laughs> for sure we, we've got a uh, collaboration happening at an international level and and what it's done is brought a lot of interest into Perth so Perth is becoming this hub for for astronomy and for space and and so recently this this international space center has also come about which the idea there is to sort of bring together lots of different people working at different facets of 
of space. So we we just deal with you know images of galaxies and and looking at the universe. But there are people that are talk, thinking about uh, growing plants in space. There are people thinking about you know policies and laws yeah. that are kind of govern uh, things around space and 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 poetry in space and all these you know space related space adjacent themes and research fields and the international space center is really about putting all those things together so that's sort of one chapter of of where we think we see uh, astronomy going forward and space moving forward in in, in australia well, you can go to our website. It's a city.space, uh, A-S-I-T-I-I.space. Uh, we've done a bunch of interviews uh, with UWA researchers and the like uh, late last year looking at that. So it's been a pleasure to be involved with UWA and just understanding the research that you're doing at the International Space Centre. Um, look, we could obviously look at many other images and talk about space forever. Um, but unfortunately, I think about half an hour is enough uh, to keep the audience interested and also wanting more. So Dr. Robin Cook, Research Associate, I'll read it out, the International Centre of Radio Astronomy Research, or ICRA. Uh, thank you very much for joining us there from Perth. Appreciate you being on Australia Space TV. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Good on you, buddy. Cheers, mate.